Okay, uh, let us pray. Father God, we thank you. You have allowed us to be here gathered at this time, listening to your word. Once again, Lord, we ask you to reveal your gospel to each of our hearts so that not only may it be useful for our salvation, but also allow us to become salt and light to the world as you will it, Lord. In the name of Jesus, who is a Christ, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. So uh, we have seen that the gospel of the Bible is a core of the Bible that so many people throughout the world have, a, have lost hold of. A lot of people are interested in prayer. A lot of people are interested in answers from God. They're interested in so many areas, but they have lost hold of the true focus of the gospel. And that is related to salvation. As Pastor Joe was discussing, the only standard of salvation is that we believe that Jesus is a Christ. And if we do not believe in Jesus as Christ according to the faith that the Bible tells us, then we might be just like so many other people who apparently had a very Christian life, who had a very godly and pious life, but in the end they were not fulfilling that requirement of salvation. Now, you may be wondering, why do we uh, talk so much about the gospel that Jesus is the Christ? Um, doesn't the Bible also speak about God the Father? Doesn't the Bible also speak about the Holy Spirit? Well, Lecture 9 um, deals with some of these topics. So the Trinity is a very, um, let's say it's a great mystery. It's something that we as men perhaps cannot understand fully while we're here in this earth. However, when it comes to the plan of salvation of God, God has, uh, God has allowed us to understand the Trinity in this way. God Himself has planned salvation. God the Son has come here and He has, um, uh, he has executed that work of salvation. And the Holy Spirit is now convincing us and He is uh, allowing us to believe in that work of salvation. So at least when it comes to the plan of salvation, we can discern the role of the Holy Spirit. But if you think about it this way, then there is a very important core aspect to what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. For instance, if we look, uh, if we look at John chapter 1, please. John chapter 1, it tells us about who we have believed in, who we have accepted. In John chapter 1, verse 1 and onwards, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but darkness has not understood it. So here we can see that John is describing to us who is that Word we have received. We understand that when John is speaking about this, he's speaking about the Christ. He's speaking about Jesus, who is a Christ, and he's not describing him as just an exemplary man. He's not describing him as just some human who came and he obeyed perfectly uh, and that it is achievable by men. Rather, he's saying that the Word of God has come to us. He's saying that Jesus, who is a Christ, once again, is God himself giving the Word of God to us as a covenant. That is to say, Jesus, who is the Christ, is God Himself. The Word, in, the Word itself is God Himself. That is who came to us. It's not something light. It's not something that we should take for granted. Rather, it is the light, it is the life, it is the Word Himself that has been made into flesh. Jesus Christ, when we say He is the Son of God, um, when uh, in the Hebrew literature or, or in Hebrew expression, when you're talking about the son of something, you're not just talking about inferiority as a lot of people take it to be. Rather, you're talking about something that shares an essence. So when you're saying that he is the son of God, you're not just saying, oh, he's inferior to God. You're not saying that. You're saying that he himself shares the essence of God. He himself is God who has come to us. So Jesus, who is a Christ, is God himself. He's the son of God. If we look at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 to 10, I'll just read uh, part of uh, verse 10. It says, all things in heaven and on earth together under one head who is Christ. So all of the things in heaven and on earth have been united under one head who is Christ. That is, God himself has 
uh, willed it so that everything is united under the Christ. Now please come to me, uh, come with me to Colossians chapter 1, please. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 to 20. It says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross so the way that Paul is describing the Christ he's not saying he's just a ticket to salvation he's not saying oh he's just the basics of Christianity he's not saying oh he's someone I should keep at the back of my mind Paul is saying that this Jesus, who is the Christ, is God Himself and everything is for Him. Everything is, is created by Him and everything in the end is under Him. Everything is united under the Christ. He is the Son of God. So God Himself has come to this earth and He has come to fulfill the role of the Christ because of our fundamental problem. So the Son of God is Jesus, who is the Christ, and in Him we can find something important. Now, you may be wondering, okay, so God the Son is so important, but how do I meet the Father? Uh, John chapter 14 tells us about this same question being asked by the disciples. John chapter 14, verse 6 and onwards. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing His work. Now, Philip was asking Jesus, Show us the Father. You are like the conduit to the Father, right? You are like a way to the Father. So show us the Father. But Jesus, in this verse, he, he seems in a way so disheartened by what Philip is asking. He says, I've been with you so long. If you really knew who I am, if you had really known who I am, if you had discerned that I am the Christ, then you'd have, you would have known I am the Father. The only way to know the Father is through the Son. In uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, we can see uh, this once again. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal to Him. The Bible is being very explicit in, which we can, in the fact that we can only know the Father if it is revealed to us by the Son. That is to say, we require a revelation from the Son. We require the Son Himself to reveal to us the Father. John chapter 1 verse 18 also says this by saying, um, it says, No one have, has ever seen God, but God the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made Him known. So nobody has seen God, but the one and only God who is at His side, He has shown God. He has revealed God. So. In simple terms, if we don't meet God through Jesus the Christ, then it means that we cannot meet the Father. We can see the Father. There are some people who say, oh, I've met the Father directly. There are some people who say, I've got ambitions from God. But the evidence that that vision or that experience was in some way not certain of what the, what the Bible is telling us about what meeting God is, is that these people have not died. Remember, if you just see God as a sinner yourself, the holiness of God will obliterate you. So if you say that you have met God without the Son, then you're different from the Bible. 
The Bible tells us only the Son can show us the Father. Only the Son can reveal to us the Father. That is why I can ask. There are many people who say, Oh, we believe in the same God, right? Your Christian God is the same as our God. And they, they say this uh, by basing, the fa basing themselves on the fact that we use the same Judeo-Christian writings as they define it. However, if their God has not been met through the Son, who is Jesus, who is the Christ, then what God have they met? What experience have they had? This is something to ponder. Not, I have not met God because I have had a supernatural experience. I cannot ensure that I have met God because I have had a vision or because I've heard things. Yes, of course, God may uh, use many things in order to, to show us the way. However, if it is not by the perfect gospel that we have met the Father, then we must truly wonder, what have we been believing in? So only the Son can show us the Father. And now what about the Holy Spirit? Now we know that the Son came, that He is the head of all things, that He uh, did, uh, did execute the plan of salvation, and that through that we can meet the Father. But what about the Holy Spirit? A lot of people think that the Holy Spirit is an emotion. A lot of people think that the Holy Spirit is a type of energy. It's a type of euphoric uh, feeling that you get when you're praising or when you're praying. But the Holy Spirit is not an energy. The Holy Spirit is not a type of emotion. The Holy Spirit is God Himself. Come to this earth. The Holy Spirit is another counselor. Come to us and ask God. Ask God Himself. He has a character. He has a personality. That means He has a direction He wants to take us in. That means that God wants to work in us specifically through the Holy Spirit. He's not aimless. If we look at John chapter 14, please. John chapter 14. Verse 26, it says, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. This verse is Jesus explaining the Holy Spirit. We must not base our faith on what a lot of people say or what I might have experienced, but rather the Word of God. The Word of Jesus Himself is saying, God will send you another counselor, and what will be the work of this counselor, the Holy Spirit? He will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. In John chapter 15, verse 26, it says, When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. So Jesus is saying, the Holy Spirit will remind you of everything I've said. This Holy Spirit will testify about me. In John chapter 16 also, John chapter 16, verse 13, it says, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. So according to Jesus, the Holy Spirit will guide us to all truth. Who is the truth? Now, if we see these three passages, we might realize then that the Holy Spirit has come to us. God Himself has shown uh, Himself to us with the Holy Spirit in order to do what? In order to reveal the Gospel to us, to remind us of the words of Jesus, to convince us of all truth, to guide us to all truth. That is to say the Holy Spirit has one purpose, which is the same purpose of the will of God. Remember, the Holy Spirit is God. So they have the same will, the same purpose. And we read the will of God um, the, in the last lecture, in John chapter 6, verse 39 to 40, Jesus is saying that the will of God is that He shall lose none of all that He was given. And also He said that the will of God is that everyone who sees the Son shall have life eternal. So the will of God, therefore, the will of the Holy Spirit is for me to believe in the gospel accurately, that Jesus is a Christ, and for me to be used to help others believe in Jesus as a Christ. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, as Pastor Cho was saying, a lot of people today are mistaken about, uh, mistaken about the work of the Holy Spirit. Many people believe the Holy Spirit to be this type of supernatural energy that comes and gives us a euphoria, and it makes us fall down, and makes us do all types of things. 
Of course, we're not denying that God has supernatural power. Of course, God can cause miracles. Of course, God can do many things through the Holy Spirit. However, if you see the Bible, why are those works of the Holy Spirit happening even to this day? What is the purpose of them? Please, um, let's check Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. A lot of people know this verse. And I've seen many churches that have this verse on their church walls. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, then you will receive power. And a lot of people just stop at that. They want the power. They want the miracles. They want the, the assurance that somehow God is working on them. And that is what many people seek through the Holy Spirit. However, if you check the Bible, the Holy Spirit is given to us. The power of the Holy Spirit comes to us for what? So that we may become witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That is to say, this is not different from the will of God that we check in John chapter 6 verse 39. It's uh, about um, all of those who have been prepared for Jesus to not get lost. That is to say, we are called as witnesses of the Holy Spirit so that through, the, through us, the Holy Spirit can testify the gospel of the Bible so that everyone may believe that Jesus is a Christ. That is to say, just to synthesize this part. Okay, so uh, God the Son, He's the head of all things. He has executed salvation. He's the one who shows us the Father. He's the one who reveals us the Father. And the Holy Spirit is constantly reminding us. He's constantly testifying to us about the work of Jesus as the Christ. So everything is centered around the work of the Son, of Jesus the Christ. If you check all the book of Acts, you can see that all of the early church members, whenever there was a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, whenever they spoke in tongues, whenever there was a healing, whenever the Holy Spirit uh, was working, it was doing so in order to confirm the word that they were giving out. And what was the word that all the early church members were sharing? It was the same message, remember? It was the one same message. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is a Christ. He's the Son of God. He's our Lord. And that was the message of the early church. And the Holy Spirit worked in order to confirm this through miracles and many showings of power. Now today, a lot of people focus on those showings of power and miracles in order to assure themselves that they're being in the work of God. But if that miracle, if that power, if that... Oh, event of driving out demons and performing many things is unrelated to the preaching of the gospel and to the believing of the gospel, then you must wonder what type of spirit is working if it's not the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit will work towards one goal. Remember, he will do God's will and God's will is what? Believing the gospel and helping others believe the gospel. But if we have works unrelated to that, if we have spirits unrelated to that, if we have many manifestations unrelated to that, then we must wonder, is it truly the Holy Spirit? Are we being deceived? Are we believing correctly? Just check the Bible. Meditate on it. The Holy Spirit is God Himself. God Himself has a purpose. He'll guide us. Towards what? Towards His will, which is believing in Jesus as Christ and helping others believe. Now many people wonder, okay, so what is the guidance of the Holy Spirit? Okay, I know now that the Holy Spirit will guide me towards His truth and His will, but what is the guidance of the Holy Spirit? Should I marry this person? Should I marry that person? What's the guidance of God? Should I take this job? Should I take that job? What's the guidance of God? A lot of people, even though they're Christians, don't know how to distinguish the guidance of God from the utterings and whispers of other things. So how can we distinguish this? Remember the Holy Spirit is doing God's will. And let us put it this way. Let's say I need to get to Tim Hortons from this place. Uh, there are a lot of Tim Hortons of course, but uh, let's say the closest one. So I need to go to Tim Hortons from here. So if I go out of this hall, should I go to the left or to the right? That's how many people understand the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Should I go left or right? But now I know I need to go to Tim Hortons. I am aligned towards one direction, towards one will. So I know that whether I take left or right, that's 
and in the great scale of things, it's irrelevant because anyway, I will get to Team Hortons because I have that one clear goal, that one objective that is according to the will. However, if I don't have that direction, if I don't know where I'm heading, can I say, should I go left or right? That's what a lot of people think. That's, they think about the guidance of the Holy Spirit as if, if it were a crystal ball telling them every direction, but they don't care about what direction the Holy Spirit is heading towards. To really be guided by the Holy Spirit is aligning myself to the direction of the Holy Spirit. It's aligning myself to the will of God. And what is that will of God? We repeated it several times. It's for me to believe that Jesus is a Christ and to help others, all the world, believe that Jesus is a Christ. And that is why you see the early church being so full of the Holy Spirit and being so full of those works of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit was working upon them because they were aligned to that one will of God. Now, what about the church today? Okay, now let's not say the church. Let's say, what about me? How do I believe in this? Do I believe in the Holy Spirit as just some emotion? Do I believe in the Holy Spirit as some supernatural working and, and it's just there to confirm that something supernatural is happening? Or am I aligned to it? Am I aligned to the will of God? So that is the Holy Spirit. Now, when we say Jesus Christ is our Lord, please let us understand this. We're not saying that Jesus Christ is not our Savior, but why can He be our Savior? Jesus can be our Savior because He fulfilled the work of the Christ. Why is Jesus our Redeemer? It's because He fulfilled the work of the Christ. Why is He our Lord? It's because He fulfilled that work of the Christ, because He's God who did all of this according to His Word. Now, let us check Galatians chapter 6, please. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. It says, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Here it says that Jesus Christ is our Lord. That was the confession of faith of the early church and of the Bible. And a lot of people say Jesus is my Lord. But what does it mean really? What does it mean for Jesus to be my Lord? It first means that He has saved me completely from all my problems. As we discussed before, Satan, sin, separation from God are problems that He ended already in the cross and resurrection. Therefore, since I am now with God, what's the problem? If the Lord is my shepherd, what is my problem now? Do I have a problem if the Lord is my shepherd? Do I really? If the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That is what should naturally happen when I am with Him. And therefore, since I no longer live, live for my needs, I no longer live for what I believe that I need, because that is all solved in the cross and resurrection, then I have one other goal I, I should live for. Not my er earthly needs, not my fleshly needs, not something that was already solved in the cross and resurrection, but I now live for one thing. I live for His will. I now live for what He wants. He is my Lord now. And we explained this uh, some time ago, but he's not, um, he's not a guest at my house. A guest can come and leave whenever. A guest is uh, subject to what you say because that's your house. But whenever you have accepted Jesus as Christ, you're saying, I'm dead with Him. I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That is to say, I am completely under that Christ. He is my new Lord. He is my new master. The owner of my life, that is Him. So my flesh, my desires, my wants, that's already solved. That's already dead. And I live in that Christ. That is to say that Jesus Christ is our Lord. And what we're talking about here is not semantics. We're not telling you to say, okay, uh, now instead of saying Jesus Christ, you say Jesus is a Christ. We're not saying that. We're saying if you say Jesus Christ, then you must understand why Jesus is a Christ and what it implies for Him to have done that work in the cross and resurrection and what it implies for Him to believe in Him as Christ. It means that you have accepted Him as your master, as the owner of your life because your life is already crucified on that cross and you are already risen with Him again. You belong to Him. 